my growing up place, monstrous and beautiful. The Rhonda Valley. My father was a miner in this place. I was the youngest of his 12 children. He regarded our arrival and presence as a noisy mishap. He was an underground ostler with no love of coal and no luck with horses. He was a catalogue of hoof prints and a founder member of the Great Depression. Our kitchen, about the size of an average hutch, was a busy bilingual bomb of a place. The first six children spoke Welsh, the bottom six English, and all at the same time. Politics in English, gossip in Welsh, and downright lies in both. I suppose in a way I've been lucky for 20 odd years I taught. And to be with the young, with their strange universe of crooked jesting, is a great privilege. And indeed a very fine accompaniment to the thing that I suppose I was meant to do from the very beginning to be a kind of humorous writer, a maker of laughter out of the most unlikely circumstances, out of the most unlikely contexts that would occasion no injury, no pain. Whether I succeeded, I do not know. I don't think that I succeeded because you cannot be consciously aware of life's strange jokes without feeling somebody's flesh somewhere or another wince resent and hate this was the heart of our town the yard of the colliery they dug the hole planted the pithead gear that carried the men to and from the surface and the town grew up around it a town's dark heart and the rest of its anatomy looked pretty strange too. This colliery has been dead for 30 odd years. In its time of life, it throbbed, clanked, snorted through all our days and nights. During strikes in our simple childish way, we thanked God for whatever quirk of conflict or wisdom had put the monster for a while at rest. And all around us were the sunlit hills on which seas of ferns afforded a paradise of refuge. On the hills we played interminably, ecstatically, but as daylight waned, our romps in the green world of the bracken were done, and we returned to this, made now more acceptable to eyes half blinded by pollen and fatigue. And here, Pontegwaith, the bridge to work, the bridge of size. They didn't come here for pleasure. They didn't come here for joy. They came here to work, to worship, to breed, to die. It was as tight a dramatic frame as that. They were like a great army come to bivouac for a night and doomed to stay for a century. The dialects of Derbyshire and Wiltshire became for us new languages. Ethnically and in terms of language, this region ceased to be a part of Wales. It became the same sort of bubbling polyglot cauldron as the New York of the 1900s. They wanted a new heaven and particularly a new earth and sang their demands in their countless chapels. to break oppression, to 
Now the landscape has turned to, to ash in so many ways, but in the minds of those who grew up in these places, the memories will burn like Hiroshima. Because out of these places, out of these pits, came not only coal, but such an abundant harvest of death that it will never truly enter into the mind of this country because to mention such calamities, such fatalities, has now become so old-fashioned, so corny, so distasteful, but in my mind will be the memory of a thing that occurred so often in my boyhood that it simply couldn't be described because men would die in those days and the coal owners wouldn't even afford an ambulance. The man was lifted onto a, a rough litter, his dead body would be covered by a sack or an old army coat, because it was near enough to the First World War, of course, for army coats to be fashionable. And the little cortege, this pathetic little procession of men, bearing their dead comrade to his home. No news having been given, of course, to the family. And they would start up the hillside, and we in our beds up there in the village would hear the first sounds of these feet. And instinctively in our ears we knew there was a moving death on its way. A man had died. He had been brought to the surface and he was being taken to his home. We would listen for a few seconds. We would put on a few clothes and rush out. And the little procession would be passing the house. And we would fall in behind the procession, half knowing who it was and half wondering who it might be. Now, this may sound like Dickensian melodrama, but Dickensian melodrama is the very stuff of this life. And this was the awful roulette that we would play in our imagination. Outside which house would that little procession stop? And of course, it had to stop somewhere. And the poor thing, the poor dead thing, would be unloaded onto the poor, widowed threshold. And there we were. Pets. Pets. He comes with soft and speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy, and bid the weak be strong, to give them songs for some. On this Saturday afternoon, they have the feeling that they haven't been fooled after all. They come from their remote valleys, from their shrunken, very often shabby villages, and now they assume the quality, the quantity of a nation. They do exist, and they make a sound that goes along with this kind of identity. But God sent his sight into the world to save you, my friend. What about it? Why not stake your claim for eternal life? Why not call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? Jesus Christ. Rugby football is one of the few enthusiasms about which the Welsh agree. They are prepared to beat each other's brains out on such subjects as religion, politics, and the correct way to sing. But on the subject of rugby, they achieve the unanimity of an early Christian catacomb. The game has a speed and a violence that nourish some deep twitching nerve, suggesting that it sublimates some itch for passion and violence that has been curbed by hard work and the evangelical surges of the chapels. There is nothing like being thrown 20 feet by an inflamed steel worker or have an ear bitten in a brutal maul to mitigate carnal enthusiasm. Our collective rugby clubs are for us what Shinto is to the Japanese. 
they exercise a powerful influence on our politics and education. The utterly non-rugby man in Wales feels like a kind of exiled eunuch. Some Welshmen regard the rugby brotherhood as a hairy mafia, and even they are trying to grow enough hair to join. They say that in the first game of rugby played in Wales, the ball was not made of leather. It was the head of a Norman bailiff. And indeed, when you watch Welsh rugby, you feel that in their minds the players are still launching their muscles and breaking their teeth against the mighty fortresses of their medieval conquerors. When the Normans came to Wales, they found the Welsh a restless and rather devilish people, I would say. Absolutely irrepressible and violent. And the Normans adopted a rather good tactic. Because when you clobber a nation, as they did us, and the body of the nation keeps on twitching, you put weights on the body to keep it still. And the weights in this instance, of course, were of stone. These vast, implacable places, open now to the sun and the wind and the remembering mind. But in their day, a manifestation of force, wealth and genius that would be hard to match. And the man who built this and 19, 20 other castles in North Wales, Edward I, a roughneck of immeasurable talent. He placed his castles near the sea so that his communications couldn't be cut off by the inland Welsh. And these places have operated in the Welsh mind. They are in the mind, like bad teeth. They ache, they insult still, a noose of stone. And very often, people imagine that the Welsh speak English rather imperfectly. They don't, you see. It is the Norman trauma. It is the old stone noose, which has never really got from around the collective neck of the Welsh. It's very often said that the Welsh are a nation of liars. I think the charge is, uh, is fairly just because telling lies was about the only hobby we could afford for centuries and centuries. We had an imaginative people who see the truth from various angles and, of course, this sort of place, this great oppressive tress of rock and as a conquered people, we learned to lie in self-defense. If the Normans asked the way to Caerphilly, we would direct them to Carnarvon. And this became one of the great sports, of course, dodging away from the truth because the truth was intolerable. Try to imagine what this experience meant to the people who actually felt it, peeping out from between the teeth of that range, looking at this place, the living fist of people who had never been invited. And we are a very hospitable people. We loved to ask people in, but the Normans were never asked in. They just came, brilliant, homicidal louts, dealing with a people whose chosen way of life would never have been violent. They fought, they fought, but always in a kind of desperate mood of disunity, because the Welsh, I think, loved disunity. And nothing has promoted more disunity among the Welsh than the flooding of valleys for reservoir purposes. Some see it as a nice materialistic gambit. Others see it as a vile desecration. There are some of us who cannot look at our loveliest valleys without peering nervously around for sight of a scout from the Birmingham Water Board ready to flag the waters in. Some, wishing to thumb their noses at the impending deluge, have ordered cottages of cork. Some are convinced that rainwater, like human speech, is a Welsh invention. In one valley currently being discussed as a possible reservoir, one protester said, if this village of ours goes under the water to promote the dropsical megalomania of the English, it will be a crime. Ours is an ideal Welsh village, five chapels and no pub. Of all the classically sad sentences uttered by the Welsh, that is the one most clearly in line for a medal. There is one thing on which the Welsh have expressed a total agreement. As great as the thirst of a city for water is the Welsh hunger for the power and mobility that knowledge can bring to the individual man. The man in his thirties and forties needing to change the direction and purpose of his life. That hunger has never been better expressed than here 
at Harlech College. For most of the students, the strain was enormous, but a few made it under the wire to a university degree. The fact that university degrees are not a passport of paradise does not matter. Those men believed in passports and in paradise. Harlech College, the first adult educational center to be built within sight of Snowdon, and a great dream. This is a kind of perfection, a great cocoon, a great honeycomb of books, and the leisure and the guidance to go racing through them, racing through time with the best minds the world has ever known. Ideally, of course, one should have the older university things attached, like port wine, so that you not only go blind with good reading, you go blind with good drinking as well, which is ideal. And yet, when you think, you see, that the beginning of this movement which culminates in this college, its presence, its life, were miners, steel workers who just wanted a kind of basic literacy, a basic understanding of life. And not only were they denied the lovely library, the port wine, so many of these men were tormented about this business of what should pleasure be. And I can recall a man now, I was walking along a pavement and I said, come into this pub, come into this tavern, and have a drink with me and he said no i want to go naked mentally naked to the grave no drugs no anesthesia i want to see life plain and terrible how luckier he would have been had he known a library like this leisure and peace like this and this is one of the workrooms one of the classrooms of the college one of the places where the chalk and the talk and the dreaming and the suffering go on. Very interesting because in this room, somebody had the very bright idea of creating a mural painting along the walls that would sum up the dream of the man who was primarily the, the founder of this place, Dr. Thomas Jones, a very influential political figure of the 1920s and 30s. And he wanted this painting to reproduce his own dream of a Wales, hopelessly divided, that would achieve one day a wonderful single identity. He ranged from North Wales, the hills, the mysterious, eternally mysterious hills, which will never really belong to mankind, of course. And we come down through the great sheeplands and a very odd race of men are wedded to those strange animals who are waiting, I think, to inherit Wales again. And then, of course, the final act, the final act of the national drama, tragedy, the valleys, the fermenting real tragedy of Wales, the farce, the marriage of men and coal and steel. The men who made these places were great, so gifted in so many ways, but very untidy. When you are forgiven the deaths, when you've forgiven the hunger, all the deprivations, it is the terrible untidiness, the filth they left behind them, the awful wake of dirt. When a ship dies, when a ship dies at sea, it succumbs and goes down to its great reliable grave on the bed of the sea, and there is something rather admirable about it. But when a pit dies, it hangs around. It hangs around. It stays there like a skeleton of indignity for all time. And this is wrong. In this valley, men desired heaven and sang about it so stridently that I still believe that heaven must have been stone deaf not to have heard us and done something about it. It was, in terms of religion, a great explosion of stone. Chapels sprang up on every corner and throughout the intervening streets. Then, of course, poverty came, and like a great wind, took it all away. These places were gutted. The chapels fell empty, silent, 
mice scurrying, replaced singing, that in its heyday had been of the standard of La Scala Milan, so vibrant, so beautiful. And in the place of the dead faith came conversions such as these, where the chapel becomes a kind of pleasure dome, not of Kubla Khan, but of people with far less taste. The preachers of the classic period in South Wales were, of course, very great actors. They had considerable voices, eyes like oxyacetylene blow lamps, which they could use with devastating theatrical effect on the more susceptible worshippers. And they would have been, they would have been the Barrymores and the Burtons of their time, because they not merely had captive audiences, but audiences that were responsive to the point of hysteria, even madness, and chapels. This is an important point. Chapels that might look grim, forbidding, and horrendous from the outside, but inside were the most magical sounding boxes. At the beginning of the century, there was a very great revivalist who stormed out of the west of Wales in one hot passionate, consumptive summer, because he did literally burn up the hearts and minds of people. Whole villages seemed to be ablaze with the message of this man. He lasted just one summer, which I think is a fair ration of time to be allowed to any gifted demagogue. If all demagogues could ration themselves in this way, we would be a happier lot of people. This man found himself in a village in South Wales. He was a passionate man. You can't be a preacher without having enormous sensible impulses the very act of preaching is an act of sex and he was the dilly of them all this man his appetites matched his eloquence and he was found one afternoon in flagrant delight in a bed of ferns and the ferns hadn't yet in that particular spring developed to a height that could conceal his activities he was spotted by the worshippers the women black with resentment told the husbands, the husbands already smoldering with spite because of the many hearts that had been taken away from their particular embrace, turned up at the chapel that night for the missionary meeting, determined to challenge, may destroy this man. He saw the moon. He could smell the approaching rope of doom. He did not try a great defense in sermon form. Oh, no, no. This man's instincts were far too well mobilized because he was the great actor manager of his time. He simply stood there for five minutes in shamed silence. I have sinned. We all have sinned. God indeed may at this moment be sinning. And then he did a very clever thing. He conjugated the verb to love in English and Welsh like a great Indian prayer, over and over again, until a massive sob rose like a bird to the ceiling of the chapel. And he knew he was there, he was home, he was dry. The weeping spread like a great flood to the chapel. And women rushed up the aisle to touch his feet, to tell him that all was understood, all was forgiven. That man, could come back today to this place. Could do the same sort of thing. Could he find the lover? Could he find the fern bed? There would be nobody to listen. There would be nobody to praise or to forgive. He would receive the tribute of neither a raised or a lowered eyebrow. Silence, indifference. A man who shares my own great curiosity about the Welsh, Ian Michael. But I think, Gwyn, that the new generation will be free of this because they haven't got our Sunday school and biblical training that gave us this guilt complex from which we can never free ourselves. They will be free of it, I think. No. The guilt seeps through like a terrible stain, a terrible dye. Take the word for beer. Beer is a lovely forthcoming word in English. It is said and is forgotten. But in Welsh, you see, the word is kuru. Kuru. 
school and repeated as it has been repeated by the Puritans in our community. It achieves the quality of all the owls of the world. Kuru, kuru, kuru. And that, to this very day, I cannot take a half a pint of beer without taking an owl's beak out of my ear <laughs> and say, get away, get away, get away, leave me in freedom. I particularly remember, Gwyn, the shock I had a year or two ago going into a local pub and recognizing that the barmaid had been my Sunday school teacher at the age of 10. And the simultaneous shock of our gaze as it met. She ducked one side of the bar, I ducked the other, yeah. and our blushes of shame so was, a drink, were mutual. Yeah. Yes, indeed, yes. In the Rhonda Valley, in the period of classic depression, they could only afford one house of ill fame. Because, of course, lust was officially not merely disapproved, but utterly ignored. But there was this one place. And it stood there, in the northern Rhonda, alongside an efferiously bad restaurant which was known as the Oily Doily, <laughs> for its neglect of certain basic requirements. But the Bordello, the Bainio, had, I thought, a marvellous name. It summed up the whole penumbra of moral uncertainty about basic sensual acts. It was known as the Guilty Quilt. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is really marvellous. <laughs> now the quilt encloses us all in a warm embrace. This place to which we came once a year for one day as a reward for Sunday school obedience glowed like a healing radium through all our dreams. Here the sea hinted at a possible escape into infinity. Hills did not block out the sky. Men did not vanish into holes in the ground. To my eyes and ears, Barry Island still wears the past like a robe of rustling laughter. We were too quiet. We were content with far too little. The universe was for us in a pebble, in the mere sight and sound of the carousel. But now the child's cry is the bird's cry, not enough. Not enough, not enough. The demands of the young circle the sky like hawks. When we came here on our annual pilgrimage, we were often accompanied by aged and ailing miners. Many of them came with us on these large and pious outings because they were loyal members of our denomination often because they wanted to help us and curb us in our more mutinous moods. And some of them, for reasons that we couldn't quite fathom at the time, they were silicotic. They were suffering from the dust. Their lungs were turning to stone. And they were behaving in a strange, instinctive way, the way the dogs behave when they swallow certain herbs. They came to the edge of the sea, and they went into the sea and drank the sea water. And the sea water was, in a rough and ready way, an emetic that helped relieve them of some of the dust that was killing them. Now, of course, you would never see that. The dust has become an ugly, vague memory and the mood is now altogether different and much more affectionate. scenic railway was the focus of all the marvels of this place. The Welsh have a taste for apocalypse, the end of the world. And time and again you would see the more pious and more frightened people standing in the whirling chariots of this thing, clutching their stomachs and shouting, Take me, O God! And this was regarded as the sovereign appearance of the entire Celtic fringe.
On Sundays, people have various reasons for gathering together in dedicated silence. Once it would have been massive chapel attendance. Now it is attendance at the bingo temples. On the green line, all the sixes, 66. Back on your white line, it's 5 and 4, 54. Yellow this time, all the two. For this region, I suppose this represents a kind of sunrise of money. But it's a most uncertain dawn. For there appears to be such little genuine joy. The bingo sounds, they seem to be a new, sad version of the old choral glories of the Messiah. I ask an ex-pupil of mine, Keith Baxter, what is a Welshman? Well, I've often wondered about that myself. I've often tried to analyse what is a Welshman. And I remember a long time ago when I first went to New York, I used to go up to Harlem on Saturday nights to the Apollo Theatre there, the Negro Theatre, where they used to have the most fantastic midnight shows. And I went up one day with a journalist, an English journalist, that was doing a piece about me for the Village Voice. And we went to one of these shows, and afterwards we went to one of the jazz clubs around the corner with a Negro musician, and we were fairly awash with uh, the evening, the liquor. And the Welsh, uh, the uh, Negro, whose only contact with the Welshman had been through the fairly sensational press of the last days of Dylan Thomas, said, uh, man, what is a Welshman, man? And uh, I'd never really articulated it at all, and I was just sitting there rather pleased with myself, and I said, well, uh, we're sensitive, shrewd, uh, a lively inquiring mind, uh, a gift for words, chatty, with a fairly uh, healthy regard for sensual appetites. And the journalist who had taken it all down, the Englishman, he looked at it, his book and he said, sensitive, thin-skinned, shrewd, cunning, lively inquiring mind, nosy, <laughs> gift for words, gift of the gab, chatty, argumentative, and randy to boot. You are a writer. And a writer can practice his craft, surely anywhere. And yet you choose to live totally in Wales. Why is that? Well, I suppose it's rather like a sculptor, you know, opting to live near Carrara Marble. My materials are there. I was born into a really stupendous jest. You know, an industry was dying. A massive popular religion was dying. And most important of all, the most dynamic and passionate political belief in Britain was dying too. I mean, the Labour Party in my lifetime has entered into stages of petrifaction and decay. And as a humorous writer, of course, I've got to be near these things. I could never be the same in London, sort of removed from them. No. And in any case, I am a firm disbeliever in a writer going to live in a capital city like London because I find London writers affected by a kind of dandruff of the brain, a kind of flaking away of, of their first integrity that they might have had in Leeds or Halifax or Hull. But I want to stay very near my sources, and indeed I want to assure the people in Wales who would dearly love to see the back of me sometimes, I suppose, that I intend hanging around for quite a bit. It is only death will remove me from those strange, dark pastures.
The hills were always a solace to the miners. This is where they came for peace, for a kind of serenity from the turbulence and the trouble of the valleys. And particularly to this place, because this was one of the great burial centers. It's a village called Flanwono, and it lies midway on the mountain top between the Ronda Valley and the Aberdare Valley. I know it intimately well because every Sunday of my childhood, my father would bring me here, walking up and across the plateau, largely because he loved the beauty of the place and wanted me to be introduced to that medium of loveliness, and largely because this was the one village where the pub would always serve him on a Sunday, regardless of the Lord and the licensing laws. And this place has an extra peculiarity which endears it to me, because it's very ironical. Because for the dead, for the perished nation of this place, there was no peace. Because the dead were so disturbed by the shifting soil that they were in sight as often as they were hidden. And I suppose this gives a kind of peculiar, crooked charm. In a way, it's a lovely epitaph on all the valleys. This strange, silent place that couldn't escape from the curse, the fever, the absolute refusal to lie down in dignified rest. You know, a story that persists in Welsh folklore from the very beginning, a funeral starts out, a much beloved man is being buried and they turn up at the gates of the cemetery. It's pouring with rain. Life could not be more disapproving of this act of love and comradeship. In addition to this, the man in charge of the cemetery has had a climax of despair. He has got fed up with seeing this great stream of dark negation filing in through the main gate. He's thrown his keys away and he's gone as a waiter to Soho which is the very reverse, of course, of this experience. So the mourners take their coffin out of the rain because they do not want to see their comrade drenched as well as dead. So into the pub they go, into the front parlour. And, of course, they are embarrassed at having this strange burden of grief with them. So they push the coffin now under one of the benches, just in time, before the landlord comes out to serve them. And they start drinking. Drinking now to an even more desperate beat because the source of despair is there under the bench, unbeknown to anybody but themselves. And wham, wham, the pints go down, and the talk starts, and the singing starts, and they become euphoric, they become anaesthetized with drink and grief. They leave the pub, and about four hours later, they wonder what happened to the central thing in our lives. Where is it? Where is the death? And of course they have to go back and make shame-faced apologies for the fact that they left the coffin, they left the body under the seat. And I think that this is one of the great central dilemmas, of course, of the Celtic conscience. It never knows where it really left the body, where it really left the death, where it really left the grief, because these are the compounds, the elements of a massive joke. There is laughter. Oh, yes, we hear the laughter, all right. But we are never quite sure about where it's coming from. 